I'm Ingolf Blüdorn and I'm teaching at the University of Bath and researching at the University of Bath. As you may pick up from my accent, I'm originally German, but I have been in the UK for quite a long time, which is an interesting experience because the UK has a very neoliberal political context and that is obviously very different from um, continental Europe, from Germany, from France. And I came here to Paris for a fantastic conference that had been organized by a team of people who are working on the Anthropocene. Uh, I'm a political scientist, or I'm not really a political scientist, I'm a, a political sociologist. So I'm not so much interested in, in, uh, in counting, I'm more interesting in, interested in telling stories, uh, in uh, providing interpretations and providing theoretical frameworks. Um, political theory in the connection with social theory is my area of specialism and I've done a lot, I've written a lot about eco-political theory and more recently also about democratic theory and eco-political theory and democratic theory are of course closely connected to each other because Ecologists have always believed that democracy is the best possible way of achieving uh, ecological outcomes. Well, eco-politics and democracy are closely connected to each other and social movements, emancipatory movements, have always campaigned for more democratization, for the empowerment of the people as the main agent for a more, democra for a more democratic and both a more ecological uh, society. Because the assumption was that eco-political destruction or that ecological destruction comes from power structures, comes from the big companies, comes from industry, comes from the capitalist economy and that empowering the people would be the necessary antidote, so to speak, to this system of global corporations imposing on us a structure that we do not want. And therefore ecologists have always believed that democracy is the only possible way and the most promising way of getting towards a more ecological um, society. And the assumption was, or one of the assumptions was, that if we give nature the same kind of freedom, the same kind of autonomy, the same kind of status of subjectivity, or also the same kind of dignity, that we as human beings as, and we as citizens demand for ourselves, then this could be a liberated condition for both sides, a liberated condition for nature, for the environment, which allows the environment to have its own integrity and enjoy its own integrity, and at the same time to have human beings and have citizens and societies their integrity and their dignity, their human right to self-determination. Now that was a traditional assumption about the relationship between ecology and democracy. And that relationship to a large extent is still true, firstly because contemporary eco-movements do still campaign for more democratization and they want to be empowered vis-a-vis -vis the transnational corporations and vis-a-vis -vis an economic system that seems to be spinning ever more out of political control and that needs to be reined in again, that needs to be politically controlled. But at the same time, there are a lot of doubts now emerging whether democracy is really and can really be a, an appropriate tool for ecologizing, for making societies more sustainable. And these doubts, they are not new. They have been around for a long time. In fact, they've been around ever since Plato and Aristotle, because they already were saying that the will of the majority is not necessarily what is good in, in the long term for a society. And they were already pointing to the fact that democracy is very much focused on the present
and does not really provide an opportunity to give voice to the future and to give voice to those entities which cannot speak, which cannot vote. So the doubts about democracy have been very old and therefore already in the 1970s and the early 1980s there have been people, have been thinkers, theorists, who have been saying, no, really, democracy doesn't get us very far. We need a benevolent dictatorship. We need an expert culture where somebody in a top-down fashion tells us what we have to achieve and that then we move on to achieving that. And in, or at the point of time, these doubts were very much crushed, they were very much um, dominated by the emancipatory movements and by the will to actually give citizens freedom to um, broaden, to open up spaces for more democratic uh, participation, for more equality and so on. And the participatory revolution has pushed this democratic uh, approach to ecological issues, to emancipatory issues uh, in general. But as we are moving into a, an increasingly globalized setup and into increasingly uh, accelerated political decision making structures and into increasingly complex political decision making structures, these doubts about democracy are coming back. So there are new voices and very um, uh, prominent voices who are now saying, no, democracy is probably not going to take us anywhere. We need to empower the experts. We need experts like the IPCC who tell us the science says that this is what has to be achieved. And then we need a form of expertocratic, a form of technocratic policy that translates these scientific requirements or what is portrayed as these scientific requirements into actual policy. And that in a sense of course disempowers the people again and pushes or moves power out of the political negotiation, out of the political arena into scientific arenas. Democracy may be structurally unsustainable, but there is another question, which is whether democracy is able to take us towards sustainability. So we have been talking about the, first, the second question so far. Whether democracy is structurally unsustainable, um, that is a slightly different uh, consideration. I think the point there is that the assumption or the, the foundation of democracy is that one citizen has one voice and one set of interests and one set of values, of political values, which can be articulated through one vote and can be organized by one political party, which represents these views and takes these views further than through political representatives into parliament. Um, in contemporary societies, this very bourgeois, or we could also say this very idealist understanding of what we as individuals are, is no longer sustainable, or it has changed. We could also say it has become impractical. impracticable. We as citizens and we as individuals have a more complex understanding of ourselves. Not only is that more complex understanding more multi-layered in the sense that we have different identities according to our different social contexts in which we work and these identities are not necessarily uh, compatible with each other, but these identities are also much more flexible. Uh, uh, willingness to change, willingness to flexibly adapt to the situations uh, which we are confronted with in the labor market, in the consumer market, in, the polit in political constellations and so on, has become absolutely vital. So willingness to be innovative, willingness to be flexible or to take Sigmund Baumann's term, will willingness to be fluid is very important. And that means, of course, that for democratic structures, it is becoming incredibly difficult to represent
because the very notion of representation, if we understand it as a notion that goes bottom up rather than comes top down, because that notion of representation is obviously also uh, available, but if we understand representation to be something that comes bottom up, that is, citizens have a will, citizens have ideas, have norms, have interests which are to be uh, represented, then the assumption is that these interests have to be more or less uniform and that they have to be more or less stable. But if they become liquid, if they become fluid, if we are becoming will, uh, constantly willing to change them and if we adapt them according to the situations that we are in, then we do not know any longer who to vote for, which is part of the problem why political parties do not seem to map any longer our life world situations, the multiplicity of our interests. We don't know to which political party to turn towards to organize and represent our, pro, uh, our interests. And political parties, the other way around, do no longer know whom to represent. And both, of course, change. Political parties design, if you want, a designer menu that is not a co coherent, consistent um, a body of ideas and thoughts, but that has that contains bits and pieces for different interest groups, for individuals in certain life world situations, and they hope that that will add up to a majority, which in the end it often doesn't, and so they have to rely on coalitions. And uh, citizens, um, uh, individuals, are increasingly not regarding any longer voting or the traditional forms of political participation, of political articulations, as appropriate or as sufficient. And many citizens therefore say, well, I don't vote anymore, voting is pointless, it doesn't make any difference. And in fact, politi politicians themselves, if we take the case of Greece, for example, in advance of an election say, well, it doesn't actually matter who wins the elections, the austerity politics has to be continued anyway. So there is an explicit disempowerment. And citizens also, apart from not using the traditional channels, are resorting to non-traditional forms of participation. And there may be social movements, there may be flash mobs, there may be blogs, there may be political consumerism, forms of pol political articulation that in a sense provides them with an arena to articulate their interests, their particularized interests, but which become very difficult in terms of aggregation. They become very difficult in terms of organization and stabilization and um, shaping or synthesizing these articulated interests into stable political programs. And we can see that, for example, if we look at movements like Occupy, which do articulate political unrest and do articulate a whole kaleidoscope of political interests and political dissatisfaction, but who do not manage, and perhaps do not even want to manage, to compress that, to synthesize that into a, a, a clearly formulated political agenda that the established, that the institu institutionalized political order can actually process, that it has mechanisms to uh, work through the political process. So in that sense, it may indeed be that democracy in its traditional form is itself not unsustainability uh, is not uh, sustainable. That doesn't mean, that again is another question, that democracy will disappear. I don't think it will. But if we from here move on to the other question, and that is the question whether democracy is an appropriate political tool for transforming societies into more sustainable societies, into more ecological societies, then in this dimension too, I think I'm rather skeptical. And a problem with that skepticism is that we don't easily have a better solution. The experts, the, expert, uh, the expertocratic um, forms of policy making, the so-called forms of evidence 
pol uh, based policy making that I was referring to before, they are not more promising than democratic structures are, I think. But nevertheless, democratic structures, if they articulate the will of the people, then they may in fact do more to sustaining unsustainable structures than to transforming unsustainable, unsustainable structures into more sustainable structures. And the reason for that is, and we've got plenty of empirical evidence, that um, people or that individuals, that citizens, are most of all concerned about sustaining their life livelihoods, their lifestyles, their acquired level of welfare, and any form of policy that may endanger that. Let's say, for example, an increase in petrol prices, or an, in an increase in any form of energy prices, or any form of um, a political restriction that for ecological reasons might or some people might regard as necessary will be opposed from the bottom up. And we've seen that most recently in the Bretagne, but we see that everywhere else where eco-taxes or any form of ecological taxation is being introduced, that actually the popular will or popular resistance, the claim to the democratic right of, say, free mobility, unrestricted mobility, of participation in a mobile culture, in a traveling culture, in a consuming culture, equal consumption opportunities for all, is regarded as a basic democratic right. And if that is so, then democracy does represent a, a challenge to the uh, transition to, to uh, sustainability. And it may, in fact, I was, as I was indicating before, more, do more to sustaining the unsustainable than actually addressing the unsustainable. The question with sustainability as a value is, of course, what do we want to sustain? And that is why the concept of sustainability itself is part of the problem. So it may not be so much democracy at this stage, but it may be the concept of sustainability itself, which is open to so many um, interpretations, deliberately open to so many uh, interpretations, and means in contemporary contexts primarily sustaining economic growth and sustaining a consumer culture. Well, the concept of sustainability is comparatively new in eco-politics. Uh, if I say comparatively new, then uh, of course we've got to take into account that it has become hegemonic. If we now talk about uh, eco-politics, we talk about the politics of sustainability or of to, uh, moving towards sustainability. But I think it is useful to bear in mind that sustainability replaces a number of earlier concepts. Um, probably, or at least one of uh, the points of concern uh, in the protection of the natural environment was at one stage an aesthetic concern. For example, protecting the beauty of nature or protecting uh, God's creation or something like that. Now this seemed to be very much open to debate what that is and it seemed to be very difficult to pin down. And so back in the 1970s, um, um, environmental concerns, or there was uh, an attempt to make environmental concerns more related to the physical environment and thereby make it more countable. And that is what, for example, the Club of Rome did by uh, talking about limits to growth. And uh, the term sustainability then, of course, emerged and became dominant in the wake of uh, the Brundtland Report in the 19, uh, 1980s, second half of the 1980s, into the 1990s, which very much focused um, environmental politics on what we now call ecological modernization. And ecological modernization is an approach that tries to connect um, uh, the 
uh, effectiveness or that tries to enhance the effectiveness of resource use, that tries to enhance the efficiency of um, the way in which we are using resources and in which we are consuming nature with older uh, ecological concerns. But it doesn't successfully do that because ecological modernization, in a sense, depoliticizes ecological issues. It takes scientific or it places scientific measurement and efficiency calculations at the center of ecopolitics, where before uh, aesthetic um, uh, orientations or aesthetic questions and value questions have been at the center of eco-political discourse. And sustainability discourses push that further. Sustainability discourses have managed one great thing. They have managed to bring together what we then started to call ideological e eco-politics. That was the eco-politics that focused on freedom, on human emancipation, on power relations that wanted to bring down capitalism in order to emancipate human beings. So it brought representatives of this form of politicized ecology together with more resource use concerned, um, uh, with more economic interpretations of environmentalism. So that was the great achievement of the sustainability discourse. But its great downside, so to speak, is that it left open what is to be sustained, for whom it is to be sustained, what, for how long it is to be sustained, with what justification it is to be sustained. And it focused on two notions. It focused on the notions or notion of resource and on the notion of efficiency. And it seemed to suggest that by means of science we can define what a resource is and what efficiency is. But of course we can do neither. A resource becomes a resource when it is valuable for us. That is, we have to assign value to an entity first. So we come back to politics. We can't depoliticize this assignation of value. And something becomes efficient if we regard the relationship between input and output as positive, as desirable, and again, for that, we have to value what input is, and we have to value what output is, and we've got the connector, connector of desirability here. So both of these concepts, um, and the concept or the approach of sustainability um, in general, they, in a sense, try to take the political out of eco-politics and try to make it scientifically accessible. Again, there has been a lot of um, a positive um, outcome of this, but at the same time it has opened or it has left open the concept of sustainability to be captured, to be hijacked by uh, particular political interests who don't, do not spell out what their interests are, but whose primary interest is capital accumulation, re, um, economic growth, profitability, and so on, at the expense of other interests. Thank you. I think uh, the politics of sustainability is um, more than anything today, the effort to sustain established order. Mm -hmm. And the concept of sustainability allows for that because it is so undetermined, because it is so open to interpretation, and because it has been, as I was saying before, hijacked now by an economic system that it seems we cannot allow to fail. And the banking crisis was evidence for that. So the economic system has become so powerful and has been so much a categorical imperative in the Kantian sense that it has replaced all categorical eco-political imperatives that political ecologists, for example, had been trying to make hegemonic in the 1980s and in the late 1970s. So the politics of sustainability is now, I think, more than anything about sustaining what we know is unsustainable. So we know that this politics of profitability, that this 
politics of capital ex uh, uh, accumulation, this politics of resource exploitation, is not sustainable. But we are adamantly decided, at least for the time being, to sustain it anyway. So I think contemporary sustainability, although politicians would of course never want to call it that, has to be referred to as the politics of unsustainability. And it's interesting to relate this politics of unsustainability to this new discourse of the Anthropocene that has come up. Because this Anthropocene, on the one hand, makes us once again realize that unsustainability cannot go on forever and it re-emphasizes limits, planetary limits, and it e emphasizes the merger between society and the environment, the hybridity of uh, human civilization and nature, and thereby emphasizes uh, the dependence of human civilization, of the human species, on the planet. So, but at the same time, it doesn't point us into any ways of resolving ecological issues, but it highlights, it further emphasizes the need to explore how this politics of unsustainability works and for how long it may continue to work. So the Anthropocene or the discourse of the Anthropocene brings home the urgency of reflecting on the limitations of human civilization and the embeddedness of human civilization into a planetary context. But I think for the time being the Anthropocene remains a somewhat remote project that politically we cannot, or concept rather than project, that politically we cannot easily relate to. But what we can take from it, and what we I think have to take from it, is that we put more emphasis on, ex on exploring uh, this politics of uh, unsustainability, on explaining how for the time being, or for investigating, how for the time being it seems to be possible, we seem to be successful in sustaining the unsustainable, uh, the unsustainable. Because we need to understand, I think, these mechanisms of what we still like to refer to as the politics of sustainability, which is actually a politics of unsustainability, we need to understand these mechanisms in order to perhaps, at some stage, crack the political nut. Uh, the key point uh, is probably uh, the concept of emancipation. Emancipation has different meanings or has had different meanings historically. Uh, if we look back to the project of the Enlightenment, if we look back to the Kantian project, then emancipation, then enlightenment, meant to empower rationality. To empower, that is also what uh, uh, the social movements of the 1970s, what political ecology very strongly demanded, uh, to empower individuals to articulate, to realize um, authentic identities. And these authentic identities, authentic self-determination, was regarded as realizing something that is internal rather than external. So the assumption was that we have some kind of innate identity that we want to articulate, that we want to live out, that we want to realize in a social context. Now this notion of emancipation as the ability of living socially, of articulating, of realizing innate identities has changed. And one could of course say it has been captured by the market. Contemporary forms of identity, of self-realization are very much consumption driven. But still emancipation for us means self-determination, means identity realization, means realizing our dream of uh, a good life. Now, if that push for freedom, if that 
push for self-determination has been integrated into uh, the market or has been absorbed by the market, positively we could say if we have embraced the market and consumption as a primary way of realizing ourselves, then of course there is a fundamental interest in sustaining growth, in expanding material consumption or expanding communicative consumption, expanding travel, expanding energy use and so on, because all of this has become an integral, an, 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 um, what's the word, uh, uh, something we cannot do without for our form, for our contemporary form of self-realization. So emancipation pushes us further into the market. We do not have any longer, I think, forms or visions or ideals of emancipation that are emancipation from the market and that are ideals of self-realization beyond the market. We do have such dreams which we nurture, which we cultivate in certain supposedly extra-economic contexts, but essentially the push for emancipation is today for inclusion into the market, into the consumer culture, participation in rather than getting rid of the consumer culture. So there is a fundamental shift that has happened since the 1980s, not that non-consumerist patterns of identity formations had ever been um, socially real or socially dominant, but the belief that the real identity, the authentic identity, is something that is outside consumption, that is outside the market, is a very old Christian, Kantian, Enlightenment form, political ecology form of understanding what emancipation is. And that form of emancipation, that understanding of emancipation, has been replaced. And if we see um, uh, movements of the excluded today, then they may to some extent be talking about overcoming the established consumer order and the established order of uh, inequality. But very strongly it is, or they are, movements for participation, for an equal share in consumption, in mobility, in communication, in information, richness and so on. So there's a huge psychological problem with the con contemporary understanding of what it means to be free, what it means to authentically realize our identity. And that notion of identity, that notion of freedom, we would need to overcome if we wanted to become sustainable in um, uh, an ecological sense. So degrowth uh, in terms of a, a contraction of a identity, pa patterns of identity formation to something that is extra consumption, the extra consumer market, ex non-market oriented would be required. But I don't see very many potentials for that at the moment, I'm afraid. There are two different ways of coping with that contradiction. One is to imagine or to try to imagine uh, alternative forms of uh, um, identity formation, alternative forms of social organization, alternative forms of economic organization and therefore alternative forms of consumption, production and consumption. The other form is to find psychological ways of coping. So if we look first of all at possibilities for the alternative, then looking back, say, to the 19th century, we did have rural communities, we did have the desire to opt out, and we had very strongly this idea of alternative cultures, of opting out, of establishing different social networks, different forms of living together in the 1970s, in the 1980s, in the context of political ecology, where the assumption was the 
agenda cannot be to participate in and to be represented by the established political order, but where we have to develop alternatives which bypass rather than engage in the established political order. Now, all of these alternatives, these attempts to imagine um, alternative forms of living have been absorbed into a consumer culture and have themselves become an item of um, uh, consumption. And as the neoliberal agenda is becoming hegemonic, it is becoming ever more difficult not only to live alternatives, we could still regard transition towns or something like that as an attempt to live, to articulate the alternative, but factually they are very much uh, on a slightly lower level of consumption, um, uh, a reproduction of the established political order because they remain embedded into the same communication structures, acceleration structures and so on. But it is becoming ever more difficult to imagine even, not only to politically realize, but to imagine that things could be different, that forms of self-realization could be categorically different from what we have at the moment. Not that we have given up entirely the dream of the simple rural life without consumption that might make us happy, but this dream only remains a dream which we dream from time to time, but we very strongly prefer and um, uh, emphasize uh, the form of self-realization that we have and regard it essentially as impossible and fundamentally undesirable to get out of that. So we may to some extent dream of alternatives when we've got a bad mo moment, when we've got a moment when we realize the fundamental unsustainability, the fundamental paradoxes that are uh, entailed in our forms of civilization, but we don't um, genuinely find the alternative attractive. If we look at small-scale, rural, local living, the form of communities that political ecologists, small is beautiful, were propagating, that is utterly unattractive to us today. It may be attractive for a day or two for, or for a summer vacation, but as a long-term form of living reduced to the village and reduced to locality and what the locality offers is utterly unattractive to us today. So what do we do in that kind of situation where we do still experience a certain form of alienation, a certain form of contradiction, of paradox that comes with our prevalent forms of, uh, ident uh, of identity realization, self-realization, but at the same time don't have a space even to genuinely think the radical different, let alone politically implement it. I think what we resort to is what I have referred to as strategies of simulation. And strategies of simulation, what I mean by that is opening discursive spaces which allow us to articulate this otherness, to articulate this dimension of ourselves that is committed to egalitarian values, to sustainability values in the ecological sense, to values of realizing an inner identity rather than a consumer identity and so on and to live in these spaces, in these arenas of, um, artic uh, of articulation, to live these dimensions of our identity out in these are arenas, experience them there but at the same time uh, realize our mainstream, our hegemonic form of identity in uh, our life world context. And although that is provocative, one may say that movements such as Occupy provide protesters with an opportunity to realize that form of identity um, or that dimension of their identity. And once the theme park has closed down, to slip back into uh, uh, other modes 
unsustainable modes of identity constructions until new spaces are required to articulate that. Now that is not a question, and that's very important, I think, of um, a, um, accusing um, individuals of making use of such spaces of simulation, of such spaces of articulating their other identity. But it is a strategy, it is a psychological coping mechanism, I think, that is being used to uh, make bearable that we live in an unsustainable society which we want to unsustain, uh, to sustain, sorry, but at the same time to be aware of um, its unsustainability and of its social and ecological implications. So it is a form of mental split, it is a, a form of um, resolving mentally or in a life world sense what otherwise uh, politically can no longer be resolved. And the same applies to democracy. We are aware that our systems are no longer democratic. And we are aware that democratic systems may actually not be a very effective mode of governance in economic terms, in ecological terms, and in, very other, uh, in, in uh, various other forms of, uh, of dimensions. But again, we have found ways of convincing ourselves in certain arenas that we are committed to the principle of egalitarianism, that we are uh, committed to democratic principles in general, whilst we know that democracy in many ways does not support the form of identity realization that has become absolutely non-negotiable for us. So simulative politics is both in eco-politics and I think in democratic politics, and of course they are related to each other, is a coping strategy. But it is not a coping strategy that individuals can or should be criticized for. So it's not a moral question as it was, for example, when we were talking about symbolic politics. In terms of symbolic politics, we were talking about elites consciously and strategically deceiving the masses and taking away from the masses their right to self-determination. So that is a, 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 a form of looking at politics that has its validity, but that has, I think, clear differences to what I'm describing as simulative politics. Simulative politics is more a bottom-up project. It is more a project in which a whole range of societal actors engages, which is very much a collective project of upholding certain discursive arenas in which we can experience ourselves as democratically committed and live out our democratic commitments, whilst at the same time not interfering with fundamentally anti-egalitarian and fundamentally non-democratic forms of decision-making and political organization. The notion of unsustainability uh, suggests that. Uh, the notion of the politics of unsustainability means that it is possible, it is quite obviously possible, to sustain the unsustainable, at least for a limited period of time. It may be that unsustainability leads to collapse, but I'm rather skeptical about the concept of collapse, because uh, political ecologists, and not just political ecologists, long before political ecology, we have believed, or we liked to believe, in the revenge of nature, in apocalypse, in eco-apocalypse, in the big environmental catastrophe that will either annihilate the human species or push us into political action. I'm skeptical about that because that scenario of fear has never worked. It has never catapulted human uh, beings or societies into genuinely transformative action. So what we have experienced instead is the build-up of our capacities to delay the collapse and to live with the collapse that is already happening. So the politics of unsustainability is very much
a politics of living with a collapse that is not in the future, but that is already there. And if we look at Greece, or if we look at certain countries in Africa, Latin America, and so on, uh, we can, of course, say that the social disaster, that the ecological disaster is already there, the disaster of unsustainability. But in our very European societies, in France, in Germany, in the UK, the collapse is already there in the form of the politics of austerity. So we know that sustaining what we have done so far is not possible. And the response that we are finding is policies of austerity which affect some, but which very little affect others. And the politics of austerity are a form of politics of contraction, but as I said before, contraction in particular for social groups which had already been underprivileged before, and a contraction that is very little felt in the, topper, in the upper parts of society. So it seems that the capacities for living with the collapse that is already there is quite significant. And therefore, we shouldn't understand collapse as an event in which everything collapses, breaks, breaks together, and where the human species, where this mysterious we that ecologists like to talk about suddenly disappears. But this we, this human species, has fragmented a long time in terms of equality. And the potential, I think, for further postponing a situation of social unrest that becomes so strong that really the capitalist system would collapse I think the potential for postponing that, and that is the potential for the politics of unsustainability, is quite significant. So what we can do is not wait for the collapse, which is unlikely, I think, to happen in the near future, although, of course, there will be ecological collapses and social collapses in certain restricted geographical areas. They are already there. And uh, we will experiencing, uh, experience, we are already experiencing the, the collapse of established notions of equality and so on. But we are not going to experience very soon, I think, the collapse of societies, of capitalism, and not the, uh, the, the human species. What we can do in that context, and the discourse of the Anthropocene, I think, pushes us to do that even more strongly, is focus on this interesting question. How do we succeed? How do we manage this politics of unsustainability? How do we manage the strange thing that sustainability, that unsustainability can be sustained. So from unsustainability, we move too quickly to collapse. There is something, something very important between sustainability and collapse. And that is what we need to focus on. So to explore how exactly this unsustainability is sustained and how we manage to cope, as I was saying before, to cope with the contradictions of being aware of unsustainability. The more we understand these mechanisms, the more might new political spheres and new political actors, which we cannot imagine at the moment, emerge to provide the foundations, the cultural foundations, the cultural capital, because that is what we need if we talk about notions of emancipation, notion of identity. The more we may have new sources of cultural capital that may re-enable us to imagine the alternative and change something about the politics of unsustainability. As a, a future of increasing tension and in particular of increasing social inequality. So clearly if I do not believe in the quick collapse and if I do not believe in the politics of sustainability really taking us beyond the established structures but further into the established structures as sustaining the unsustainability, then this sustaining the unsustainable can only come at the expense of social exclusion.
as nature has been fully captured, uh, uh, the finiteness of the globe becomes ever more clear and ever more visible. And the economic crisis, the global economic crisis, has made it, I think, the banking crisis, more clear than ever before that this model is not generalizable. But, so it has uh, reminded us of limits to growth, but these limits to growth don't stop us, don't stop the powerful to continue the pathway on which they have been, which means that we are invariably uh, further developing the established val um, uh, system, the established order, patterns of self-realization at the expense of social exclusion. So the future is a future of rapidly increasing social inequality and social exclusion. And I think that is what we are seeing, not only globally, that what we are seeing in the richest European societies and that of course we have seen in the United States for a long time. Combined with that or going along with that, it will be a future of technological means of controlling that social inequality. So the whole debate about NSA, about surveillance, about fortress Europe, about migration and so on, uh, will become ever more uh, virulent, will become ever more powerful because as social inequality is increasing, the control of social inequality and the attempts to criminalize, to um, uh, have a legislative complex that uh, controls the excluded and so on becomes increasingly important. So the, the emphasis of politics will uh, uh, increasingly turn to matters of security, which have already um, uh, shifted into, into the very uh, center of sustainability politics. So security politics and sustainability politics will merge and that will be a form of social exclusion policy of managing social exclusion and strangely democracy I think is suitable as a tool or I need to say the contemporary form of democracy it seems to be uh, suitable as a tool for managing for legitimating this form of exclusion. So I think the future is not collapse but the future is one of increased social inequality and social tension. But I'm afraid that the technological means of controlling that inequality and that social conflict are far from being exhausted at the present stage.